So um, we're back in Acts chapter 7 today, and <clears throat> we didn't get through, it's a long chapter, we didn't get through it all, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it basically is uh, 1 to 53 is Stephen's speech, or Stephen's um, at his trial with the Sanhedrin, and then at the, the last four verses, or the last six verses, sorry, are about Stephen's death, and so we didn't get through all that, but I want to go big picture and, and recap some things, and I want to make sure you see it, that Stephen's speech is really, really important, and if you remember what's happening is, the, um, uh, Peter and John and the other apostles, we had Pentecost, Holy Spirit's come in, they went to the temple, they healed a man, in, a lame man in the temple, they got brought before the Sanhedrin, and remember the Sanhedrin are the authorities, they have their own police force and they have the ability to kill you, which is why they killed Stephen, uh, for blasphemy, or, or supposedly blasphemy. So, Peter and John, they threw them in jail, if you remember, and for what they had done, and then when the, the next day they called them, they said, go get them out of jail so we can put them on trial. And they had the, the, the Holy Spirit had come and opened the jail up, and they were out of jail already. And so, and that's a way God did. Now with Stephen, it's going to be very different. So Stephen comes in, and he's actually doing healing as well. He's doing miraculous things. And so what the Sanhedrin does is they got to discredit this guy because he's talking about Jesus. And so they got to discredit him. And remember, and, and the Sanhedrin are all, here's the problem with the Jews, is that they're going through the motions of temp, what I call temple worship. In other words, everything is about and revolves around the temple. That's it. That's what everything is and everything revolves around. And through that, over these hundreds and hundreds of years, they were going through the motions. In other words, they, were, they had fallen for the sin of forgetting about God. It was all about the temple. Temple, temple, temple. Because God, God dwells in the temple, right? Isn't that where He is? God dwells in the temple. Well, He did until Jesus came up out of the grave. And there He no longer does. And I always find it interesting, He doesn't mention this, so what they do is, <clears throat> they take Stephen, and they say, we can't, we, we can't out-argue this guy. He, he's too powerful. And so what they do is they paid some people to come and say that Stephen was blaspheming against Moses, and against the Mosaic law, against the law. And that is that's, that it qualifies to arrest Stephen, which they did, bring him before the Sanhedrin. And so what he does is he goes through, in verses 1 through 53, is his speech to them. And basically what he does is he takes them back to the Old Testament, to their own history, which they knew, and he shows them why the history isn't temple-centric. In other words, what he's doing is he's trying to find, he's trying to tell them, and then at the very end, in the last verses, he does tell them exactly what's going on. What he says is, you've forgotten about God. You don't have a relationship with God. And what we want to do is we want to glean out of this as we study it. We want to go, let's not fall for the, let's not fall for what the people had and go through the motions. It's not, a, Christianity is not about Sunday mornings in church and Wednesday nights in church. That's not what it's about. That's an add-on, if anything else. It's about a relationship with God. He wants a daily relationship with us where we're walking by the Spirit, we're seeking the things of God, we're getting more God-like, if that's a word, and less materialistic-like. In other words, we're, we're separating ourselves from all the things that the world says we need. All the things that are on the TV and the commercials and all those things. You've got healthy, wealthy, and wide. All the stuff you've got to have. And God wants a relationship with us. The sin of forgetting God is when religious people forget God when they put a system in place and says, I must be doing good with God because I've been in church every Sunday for a month. And we fall for that because we're a works-based mentality. That's who we are, right? I, go, I say this all the time, but it's so important. What do we do? What do we do with kids? Behave, you get dessert, right? Behave in school, you get a star by your name. Don't behave, you know, do well in your job, you get a promotion or a raise. So everything is works-based for us. And then when we try to take works-based things into, we become temple worshipers. Amen. We're, just, we're, just, we're just church worshipers is all we are. We're, we're following for the religion of the day. The temple in the Jewish mind was central for everything that went on, everything. And I always wonder when he, um, obviously right now, where Stephen was, you don't need the temple anymore. And I, and I always think, when he's making the speech, is he thinking in his mind, and he wants to say, look at the veil. The veil's torn. 
Don't y'all realize God's not dwelling here in this temple anymore? He now dwells in hearts. And that's where he's going with the speech. And it's interesting because you know that Stephen is so filled with the Spirit that he, he mimics Christ at the end when he looks and he says, Father, forgive them. I mean, they're killing him. And he says, forgive them. Hard to do. The Jewish leaders couldn't cope with the skilled preaching and teaching of Stephen. And that's why if you go back to chapter 6, verse 11, they got people to say, they paid people to say that he was blaspheming against Moses and against God. So what he was preaching and what he was doing was saying that Christ had fulfilled the Mosaic law and he was a type of temple. That's what he was saying. And they couldn't get by with that because if Jesus was who Stephen said he was, then their whole system is blown up. And remember, the, the Sanhedrin are, they, they, they really don't believe in God hardly, and they're all on the graft. It's, it's terrible. And we're going to see Paul, we're going to see Saul of Tarsus today. Um, so, three major points in Israel's history that he's going to go through and talk to them about. And that is the presence of God is not restricted to any one land or material such as the temple. And then secondly, God dwelt with Israel before there was a temple, and he'll deal with them afterwards. And Israel had a history of doing what? If we go back in history, and this is what Peter or what Stephen's going to tell them in this long diatribe, is they have a history of rejecting their leaders. We go all the way back through history, they rejected their leaders. And so that's where we started in with this. And he's saying, You've just rejected them again. So we started with Abraham, verses 1 through 8 of Abraham. One through eight is about Abraham. And what is he saying about Abraham? What he's saying is, look, there was no temple, so where did God dwell? He dwelled wherever Abraham was. And he went, remember, he went to Ur, Chaldeans, and he got Abraham. Abraham, think about Abraham. Abraham was a was not Abraham wasn't tied to a place. God went and found him when he was a pagan, by the way. He wasn't seeking God. God sought him. God reached down and, and he said, come, I'm going to take you to another place. And what did Abraham do? He got up and he left. He left his home and he went. And so we think about what is Stephen trying to explain to him. He's trying to explain that the landless Abraham, Abraham was in, in Mesopotamia. Moses was in the wilderness. Joseph was in Egypt. Where was God? He was with them. So he's trying to emphasize, you don't, God is not... God is not only in the temple. He's where his people are. And of course he's trying to explain, he wants to, ultimately wants to explain to them that God through the power of the Holy Spirit dwells and now the temple is, is us. So the Jews were nationalistic. In other words, they looked at God as a tribal God. What was he? He was the God of Israel, his chosen people. So God, so they were all about, God is about Israel. God is about Israel. Well, Stephen knew, understood through the power of the Holy Spirit, that it wasn't just about Israel. It was about, Is it was about the Jews, but it was also about the Gentiles. So Stephen's biblical view was that God wasn't a tribal God, but a sovereign God over the entire universe and all the people. That's why he goes back to right. Abraham, Abraham is, 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 I would say Abraham is more important to the Jews than even Moses is, because he's where they first came from, right? Out of that. And so what he's doing, he's saying, well, wait a minute. There was no temple. Abraham was out doing his thing. He was a pagan. And God reached out and found him. So God dwells with them. He's sovereign over, if he was sovereign over Abraham, Abraham wasn't a Jew from that perspective. He was sovereign over that. So then what does he do? That God revealed himself to Abraham before there was a law, before there was a temple. Abraham is not pictured as someone seeking God, as I said. In fact, Abraham was blind. He wasn't seeking God. But God took the initiative to save him. What does he do with us? He takes the initiative to save us. God dwelt in no particular place in the days of Abraham, but he dwelt wherever Abraham was. That's the point of verses 1 through 8. And then, um, then he comes back to, well, we won't go into the, <coughs> excuse me. Stephen reminded them that God dwells where his people are. And we read John 4 last week with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. <coughs> and she says, and who is the well? Who dug the well? Jacob. It's Jacob's well. So he goes all the way back to the patriarchs. And so remember, the Samaritans are half-breeds. They're part Jew, part Gentile. And what they said was, no, 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 the temple shouldn't be in Jerusalem. It should be on Mount Gerizim, which overlooks where she was, where the well is, which is where what? Where Abraham built his first altar to God. 
And so they go back and so the Samaritans say, no, Abraham's first place with God altar was right here. This is where we should worship. So again, the presentation isn't to argue is the Samaritan woman right or is the or are the Sanhedrin right? The idea is saying God doesn't dwell in the temple anymore. And by the way, he dwelled with his people before the temple. So what he's trying to explain to them is this whole idea of God dwelling in us or God being with us versus being in the temple isn't new. It wasn't new with Abraham. By the way, it wasn't new with Moses. Because think about, man, we'll talk about Moses when we get to him in just a minute. So the second thing is in verses 9 through 19 is Joseph. And they rejected, look at this, he was a leader. And they rejected him. Well, what do you mean they rejected him? Okay, well, who were, how, how many brothers did Joseph have? Eleven. Eleven, okay. Those twelve brothers, right, are the, the, the sons of Jacob. Those are, the, and, and what's the significance of those twelve men? They are the twelve tribes of Israel, right? So they're what's called the patriarchs. A-R-C-H, something like that. They're the patriarchs. And so they, so they're revered. But now let's look at them. What did they do? What did the patriarchs, the 11 patriarchs, do with the 12th patriarch? They rejected him by putting him in a pit. And sell, they were going to kill him, but then they didn't have the guts. And so they sold him into slavery. And so we know what happened. 12 patriarchs, the head of Israel, they were motivated by what? Envy and hatred, and they did what? They rebelled against God by taking their brother and selling him into slavery. So do you see, they rejected. So what, what Stephen's trying to point out is, you continue to reject your leaders. Let me show you, you've been doing it since the beginning. You rejected Joseph, right? So Stephen undoubtedly picked Joseph because what? Joseph is a remarkable type of Christ. And when we think about it, Joseph was rejected first by his brothers, but the day came, then what happened? Then when he was in Egypt, right? You remember, everybody remember what happened in Egypt? So there was a famine coming to the land. His brother, his father sent his brothers to Egypt to figure out, and Joseph had been doing what? Storing up grain. And so they went, and his brothers, they found him, and he, he told them who he was. The second time, they accepted him. And then, of course, they got stuck in captivity and bondage. So then we went to Moses. And what do we learn about Moses? Moses is verses 20 through 43. Moses, okay? But let's talk about, let's talk for a minute about who Moses was. The first 40 years of his life, he was in Egypt. And he was raised, remember, you remember the story, right? He was, the firstborn of the Jews was to be killed. His mother took him, put him in a basket, pushed him out in the Nile. One of Pharaoh's daughters, Pharaoh's daughter? Yeah, Pharaoh's daughter's, handmaidens found him. They raised him as Pharaoh's son. He had everything. And he had all the education because remember that the, the Egyptians were highly educated, right? They built the pyramid. They built all these things. They did lots of, lots of, and so he was raised, he was raised in royalty. I mean, royalty. He's a prince. Think about that. He's Pharaoh's son. He's a prince. So he, the first 40 years, and it's interesting, in Hebrews 11, 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, this was the first 40 years, he was in Egypt as Pharaoh's son. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of the treasures of heaven. So then what happened? So when we go and we look at our verses and we see what happened with Moses. So let's look at that real quick. Um, what did what when when Moses went out? So Mo, here's Moses. He's 40 years old. He's he's the prince. He's the ro he's royalty. He goes out amongst his people. He knows they're his people, and he sees the Egyptian guard beating the Jew. And what does he do? He kills him. So you would think he's ready to take on the rebellion. And then what do the, what do the what do the um, what do the people say? Men, you brethren, why do you injure one another? But one of those injuring his neighbor pushed away. This is, the, this is the Jews rejecting Moses. This is verse 27. And here's what they say. Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Who made you a ruler and judge over us? That's what the Jews said to Moses. That's verse 27. Right? And they did what? They rejected Moses as their leader. 
So Moses has, and then they go, and by the way, you know, you killed that guy. So Moses leaves. How long is he in Midian? He's in, he is in Midian for 40 years. And so what was God? God promoted him to Pharaoh's son in his first 40 years. His second 40 years, he prepared him in the wilderness wandering. Moses, God's deliverer of Egypt, uh, was rejected by Israel there in verse 27. The Sanhedrins and the Jewish nation had said the same thing about Christ. Remember what they said to Pilate? They said, we do not want this man to reign over us. We have no king but Caesar. Remember Pilate looked at the Sanhedrin. These are the leaders. These are the ones when he was on trial. And Pilate said, guy says he's your king. And what did they say? We don't want this man to reign over us. We have no king but Caesar. And then they're the ones who said, kill him. We want him killed. We want him crucified. Same thing, and the same rejection that comes from that. So, then we pick up here this week. Um, and then the final 40 years, what happened? God empowered him. So Moses was 120 years old. First 40 years as Pharaoh's son. Second 40 years in the wilderness. Third 40 years, what was he doing? Traipsing around the wilderness. Try, I'm sorry, second 40 years with Midian. Then the, the third 40 years, he was traipsing around with these, these stiff-necked people. Deuteronomy 18.15, that's what he called them. He called them stiff-necked. Because as he's up on the mountain, right? He's on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, talking to God. They come down, they've already rejected him. They've already rejected him because they told Aaron, build us a calf. Right? And then what did they spend all their time doing? We want to do what? We want to go back to Egypt. Our hearts are in Egypt. Right? In other words, it's all back. Egypt would be the same thing. Well, and so what would you call that? I'd call it comfort. Comfort zone. So the temple's comfort zone. Egypt comfort zone. Well, you know, instead of wandering in the desert, at least if we go back, we're slaves, life stinks, but we're really comfortable there. Why? Because they've been doing it for 400 years. Right? It's what their parents did, and their grandparents, and the great-grandparents, and the great-great-grandparents. Right? So it's that comfort. Are we comfortable? Are we getting too comfortable where we are, people? Right? Part of, our, part of our goal this year is, 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 is it's a year of missions. Missions, missions, people that go on mission trips, people that become missionaries are willing to get out of their comfort zone. People who constantly share their faith with folks are people who are willing to get out of their comfort zones. Because comfortable to sit here, right, whether they know I'm a Christian or not, I can just be quiet, I mean my own thing, I know I got God. Well, God wants you to stand up and say, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Or they're rejecting. So God empowered him. Moses was rejected by Israel, and then he was sent, right, he was rejected by Israel, verse 27. That was at age 40. Then he was sent back at age 80 to lead them and to deliver them out. God empowered and taught him that his strength was in God. Remember, and it's a cool analogy, because if you think about it, what did Moses do when he saw the when he saw the the the, the travesty that was going on with his people. Because remember, he was the first 40 years, he's an ivory tower guy. He's not out there understanding the people are, that, that, that the Jews are getting beaten and all that. He may have known it, but he's an ivory tower guy. When he goes out and sees it, what's he do? He tries to take things into his own hands. I know what I'll do. I'll kill the Egyptians and I'll get the people to rise up against it. You hear what I said? I, I, I. And God said, now you're the wrong, wrong attitude, man. Let me send you to the wilderness before mm -hmm. send you to the desert for 40 years. And we'll work on you. Anybody interested in going to the desert for 40 years? How about 40 days? How about 40 hours? 21 days of day. Um, verse 36. Look at verse 36. Moses, 35 and 36, Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge? That's in 35, he's repeating it. Is the one whom God sent to be both the ruler and deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared with him in the thorn bush. This man, Moses, led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. It's interesting. What was he doing? He was doing signs and wonders where? See, this is important. Geogra ge geography is important here. It says he was doing it in Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness. Guess what? There was, no, there was no tabernacle. Or there was no temple. There was a tabernacle. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then look at verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, quoting Deuteronomy, 
says, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. And this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and received living oracles to pass on to you. He's talking about Jesus. And what was he telling, what was he telling the Jews? He was saying, God's going to raise up somebody from within your tribe. And what's he going to do? And he talks about he was in the wilderness. He was with the angel in the thorn bush. That was Jesus. So he's reminding them again. The whole point is, don't get so hung up on temple worship. Look, God's always dwelt with his people in these, in these areas. So let me give you a little sidebar on this with Moses because I think it's important. Um, Forty years is a long time to be in training for a job. Forty years. I mean, think about it. Anybody, if you wanted to be a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it would take to be a neurosurgeon, but Holly, 10 years? 12 years? 12. Not 40. Yeah, 12 or 15. Not 40 before you actually get your, get your job, right? This is what he was doing. What was he? He was preparing and maturing him in spiritual strength during that time. This frustrates me. God's never in a hurry. You know who's in a hurry? I am. I want it now. I want this thing done. God is never in a hurry. He spends years preparing those. Go study Paul. You know, Paul had the road, the, the experience on the road to Damascus, right? Then he went to the wilderness for training. Then he came back and messed up and then had to go for more training. He spent a long time. We tend to think that, oh, he had this conversion. Everything was great. Boom, boom, boom. He was this great man of God. No, God had to train him for years and years. And we know because of who Paul is, who Saul is, he had a lot of reprogramming to do on him. Because all the ways that he was thinking. Sometimes he uses fires, like prolonged pain, like Joseph. Joseph, think about Joseph all the time in jail, right? And the one guy in jail, he's with the jail, says, hey man, when you get out, remind the Pharaoh, I'm in here, tell him to get me out. The guy says, yeah, I'll do it. As soon as he got out, he forgot. All these things. God is in the process, don't miss this, of educating us for future service. Not just educating us to educate us, but what? For service. So he's saying, I'm trying to educate you. So he took Moses. Moses is a great example. He spent 40 years in the wilderness, mundane things while God was working on him so that he could do what? Go stand before Pharaoh and lead the people out of captivity. Right? Um, and if we gain the qualities that make us ready for that, then he'll do it. He is never late. I read this great quote that said, the second minute and hour hand must all point to the precise moment when God is ready. All three. Got to be all three right aligned up when he's ready. And when he is, but before that, when the seconds are going, he's not ready yet. So remember, he may have us down a 40-year a trek, right? but he's trying to gain us something. And, you know, I, I think, this is my opinion, I'll go completely different. Um, Moses was 40 years, and that's how God had it and, and had ordained it. But it's a difference. Look at Peter and John. They did nothing different than what Stephen did. They got thrown in jail. They got released. Stephen didn't get thrown in jail. He just got killed. So God chose to have Stephen come on home. And he chose Peter and John to stay around for a long time. Which was worse? I don't know. Yes, sir. I'm just... Something you said earlier, but it's coming back now that just kind of caught me, was reading that verse and we talked about when, when Moses murdered that man, and he thought they would recognize that he was there to lead them. Absolutely. And, and he was there to lead them. That was going to be the ultimate plan, but you can't rush God's timing. Mm -hmm. And he tried to rush God's timing, and obviously it didn't work out. So Explain much better than I did. No, that's awesome. It is. It's exactly what it was. He thought, they're going to rally behind me. Let's go. Time to fight. God says, I don't need you to do my fighting. I'll do my own fighting. Thank you. And that's what he did. So, then 37 through 43 through, what did I just say? 37. 37. Oh, Israel's rebellion. And this is, so if you want to break out 37 through 43 is Israel's rebellion. And what is rebellion? 
I think in context, rebellion is just doing the things the way I want to do versus the way God says to do it. Right? Going through the motions. I want to do the things I want to do. Right? I want to show up on Sunday mornings and I want to show up on Wednesday afternoons, Wednesday evenings, and check the box, man. Done. Here, God. Yeah, check. 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 God says, man, you're, you're asking to go to the wilderness for a little while when we do that. Right? Stephen defends the charges and was blaspheming against Moses. Moses actually is, if you look at that, Stephen's point is the Jews in Moses' day uh, thought little of his leadership. And Moses' disciples and Stephen, they were the ones in this teaching, they were the ones rejecting. And that's why he took them back to Deuteronomy. Think about it. Here's Stephen. We don't know much about Stephen. Was he educated? Don't know. Didn't matter whether he was educated. He had the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. He had the Holy Spirit. Are we operating in the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are we operating in our own power, occasionally allowing a little sprinkle dust to come in and do that? When, you know, when we need him. Right? When, when things are going poorly and I need to be rescued. Then I want to reach out and, and see what's going on with that. In verses 38 and 39, we just, we're going to just bust through several of these. Um, this is the one who was in the congregation of the wilderness, right? together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. Right? They turned their backs to Egypt and imagine what it would be like to be back there. Christians, do we long to go back to the world that we have been delivered out of. If you're born again, you've been delivered out of the filth of this world. Do we long to go back? Are our hearts constantly turning to the things of old? That's a challenge for us. What we ought, we ought to be asking ourselves. We say we deplore certain sins of the world, but the, frat, the flesh right, secretly imagines ourselves. And what does God say? Go read half of Proverbs. God looks at the heart. Now, I want you to say outwardly, you think outwardly, where is your heart? Verses 40, 40 and 41, even in the wilderness. So look at 40 and 41. It says, They said to Aaron, Make us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. He's up on Mount Sinai with God. And at that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol, and they were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Wow. They just come through the Red Sea, by the way. I mean, it wasn't like that was years ago. That was like a, a couple of days ago. They'd come through the Red Sea. And they already had forgotten God. We cannot, cannot think that we are better than them. Now, we do have a plus. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, right, which can do that. Then look at 42 and 43. Continue on. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. It was not me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha and the images you made to worship. I will also remove you, Babylon. Look at this. Their history of rebellion and idolatry began in the wilderness and it continued for <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of years. Think about it. 400 years, give or take, in slavery in Egypt. God dramatically rescues them out. And from the day he rescued them out in, till the end of the Old Testament, they continued to rebel <coughs> God. I mean, again and again and again. I mean, look what he says. This is Stephen quoting, right? He says, you also, in the 40 years in the wilderness, you also took along the tabernacle. So they had the tabernacle of Moloch. Right? That's the child sacrificing God, by the way, if you don't know who that one is. Um, and the star god of the god Rampha and the images, and they took it with them everywhere they went. Isn't it crazy? For their idolatry, God punished them, and they spent 70 years, I mean 40 years, and then later all the way in Babylon, 70 years in Babylon because of their idolatry. Because of what? Going through the motions. What it should say to us is the sin of forgetting God, which is what I call going through the motions, is really serious. God, it caused God to put his people in captivity after years and years, hundreds of years of continuing to reject. You know, go read Kings and Chronicles. This king was bad. 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 They forgot. And remember, they forgot God so much that they forgot there was the law. You, everybody remembers that, right? When the guy's down, you know, I think we'll clean the temple out, see if they maybe have a garage sale. 
comes back to the king and goes, Hey, look, I found this book. It's called the law. Do you think we ought to take a look at this? They had forgotten the law. If they can forget the law, we can forget the law. The verse says because of Israel's idolatry, God turned away and delivered them up to more corruption. So think about this. Because they wouldn't self-correct their sin of rebellion and idolatry, God gave them up and drove them into captivity. Yes, sir? 200 years ago, we were a Christian nation founded by God and led by God, and now we're turning away, and do you think we'll ever... The God of Moloch is alive and well, brother. If we'll ever come back. Mm -hmm. Sure, child sacrifice. <coughs> Happens all the time. <coughs> are we... So here's some questions we think about this as we go through. And again, these are just... I just pull them out and lift them out of the text. Are we secret idolaters? Mm. Do we worship fame, money, prestige, glory, materialism, someone or something? Anything we put before God is idolatry. Are we in spiritual captivity because we refuse to give God all and everything in our lives? I don't know. But I think it's something we have to think about continually. So, next section of his, of his message is verses 44 through 50. All right, and so let's let's read those. And this is about the tabernacle. And again, it's it's important. So we get the tabernacle. So let's look at that. Forty-four through fifty. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness. Y'all remember the tabernacle, right? That was where that was where they would set up because they didn't have a tent. They didn't have Jerusalem. They were wandering, right? Tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness. Just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which you see. Very detailed how you do it, what you're supposed to do with it. And after having received in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers. Isn't that interesting? He recognizes, y'all didn't drive, we didn't drive anybody out of the promised land. God drove them out. That's a difference there. Until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might build a dwelling place. So remember, all the way up to David, <clears throat> they didn't have the temple. They had so so he's saying, wait a minute. So now look at this. No temple with Abraham. No temple with Joseph. No temple with Moses. Wow. All of these. No temple in the wilderness. So do you see your simple focus, but yet historically we've never been temple focused. <clears throat> so David. And then David said, finally, they had the tabernacle, they had it built, and they had it in Jerusalem. And David said, I want to build a permanent temple to God. And remember, the whole reason that they had David was because they had Saul, and the whole reason they had Saul was why? Why did they, why did they have Saul as king? They wanted a king. They wanted a king. They at, Everybody else has a king, we want a king. And God's up there going, am I not good enough to be your king? <clears throat> and so they built that. And of course, they couldn't. Uh, David was not allowed to build the temple because he had so much blood on his hand from so much warring. Solomon, his son, built the first temple, Solomon's temple, which is the one that we have. Um, the one that was there that was ultimately destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Remember when the Babylon, they went to Babylon? And then when they came back after 70 years of captivity with Ezra and Nehemiah, one well, of the first things they did was they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. So historically, so the portable tabernacle in the wilderness, oh, let me finish reading that, the dwelling place, but it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. And then Stephen quotes the prophet. What's he say? Heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool to my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand that made everything anyway? He sees, says, look, man, y'all want a temple because everybody else has got a temple. Just because you've got a king because everybody else. I, the earth is my footstool. Look what he says. It was not my hand that made everything. Everything you have is from me, so you can look around and you're in a temple all the time. To paraphrase, right? So, the portable tabernacle in the wilderness was outside the Holy Land. It could be set up any place. So, again, he's trying to show God can dwell anywhere he wants to. Right? The main thrust of Stephen's message was that Israel always resisted and rejected the deliverers that God sent to them. How many prophets did they kill? And he's going to tell them that here at the end. He's going to tell them how many prophets. He's going to remind them how many prophets that they killed. Um, they opposed Moses and they wanted to return to Egypt. They opposed Joseph and he later became their redeemer. 
They rejected the prophets God sent, and they killed a lot of them, by the way. And finally, they rejected their own Messiah and crucified him. That's what he's bringing up to him. He's saying, look at your history, man. Y'all keep messing up. We keep messing up. <clears throat> he calls himself we. We keep messing up. When are we finally going to understand that we have the Messiah? Israel's history reveals the patience of God and the, kind, and, the, and the hardness of man's heart. You think about it. If you go all the way back to where we've been here, starting with Abraham, we're starting with the rejection with Joseph, and go all the way through. For thousands of years, they keep rejecting. And God keeps saying, I love you, I want you, and I keep, I keep coming back. I keep coming back. I keep drawing you back in for the stuff. It reveals there's a ray of hope because Israel rejected its deliverers the first time but accepted them the second time. So how do we tie that together? That was true with Moses and with Joseph and will be true with Jesus because the Jews rejected Jesus the first time. They put him on the cross. But when he comes back, go to Revelation, 144,000, those are Jewish martyrs. Yes. yes. Yeah, those are Jewish. So they, they, they are going to come back again, right? And so the difference is, and then now he just finishes up, and so now it is the 51 through 53 is the indictment. So now he, he gives them this great history. He shows them by their own example, by their own history. He wasn't making anything up. He wasn't telling them anything they didn't already know. He told them everything. He just reframed it to say, don't you see? It's not about the temple. You guys, in fact, the Sanhedrin had gone through all these motions. They didn't even, they didn't even believe. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in afterlife. They didn't believe in any of that stuff. They didn't believe in spiritual gifts of any type. So they had rejected God a long time ago in favor of what? Temple worship. And really, and remember, go back to this thing about the Sanhedrin. Jesus and the money changers. How did the money changers get into the temple to set up their own booth? So Willie is a money changer. And Willie says, you know, I really would like to set up in the temple because that's where the good business is. So he comes to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin says, okay, well, you give me a piece of what you do, we'll let you money change in the temple. Right? Oh, yeah, by the way, you can't bring your own goats to sacrifice, your own sheep. you got to go buy them from the Crockett sheep pen. Right? Well, guess what? The Crockett's, y'all can charge whatever you want, but 50% of it is coming to the Sanhedrin. Sure. I mean, they really were. Absolutely. They were. They had their own police. Their own police. I mean, think about it. They arrested Peter and John, threw them in jail immediately, right? Did the people rebel? No, they had their own police. It was to police their own, to, to police their own folks. So here comes the indictment. Look at this. And he said, this is just a repeat of Deuteronomy. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one, of the pro which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. And you received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. So he went from a history lesson to an indictment. He smacked them in the head. Just right in the head. And so... What does he do? He brings this by accuses them of denying God's prophets and his spirit and Moses. And they are heathens at heart and dead to truth is what it says, right? You're stiff-necked and uncircumstanced in heart and ears, always resisting the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he's telling them is the Holy Spirit is trying to woo you right now to salvation, and you're resisting him. Right? Same thing Conrad will say in an hour, right? If today is the day, Right? If God is moving on your heart, that's what Stephen's telling them. But you keep rejecting the Holy Spirit, and you keep resisting the Holy Spirit. Go back to Peter. Go back in Acts. I think it's chapter 4. Um, but read Peter, read Peter and John's speech to him. What's he do? He begs them to come to Christ. He begs them. He says, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what it says. He says, you killed him, but come to him. He's here, the very people. Not down the line, down the line, down the line. These are the very people that had rejected Jesus and put him on the cross. The Jews, by rejection of the Messiah, were in rebellion and resisting the wooing of the Holy Spirit. The Jews whom Stephen was preaching were just as rebellious as the Jews in Moses' day. Just as rebellious. Moses called, Moses called them in Deuteronomy stiff-necked. Because remember, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Why did they wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Because they rejected God. They rejected Moses as their leader. We can't go into the promised land. It'd be too hard. Let's just go back to Egypt where everything we knew what was going on. Right? Got three squares a day. Had to work like dogs, but you know, 
That's just part of it. Um, they had been given a message of Christ by Christ himself and the apostles. So remember, Jesus told them who he was. The apostles told them who they were. The apostles, Peter, John, and then the other ten apostles back in the uh, in early part of Acts said who he was. The Holy Spirit was striving with them, helping them to understand the <coughs> conviction, but they resisted it. Their rebellion and refusal to bend their wills to Christ showed that they were as guilty as their ancestors. And that's the whole point. And so he goes in 52 and he says, you're the ones who actually betrayed him and you're the one who actually murdered him. He accused the Jews of murdering Jesus, which they did. And then in 53 he says, and you received the law as ordained by angels. In other words, God gave you everything you needed and yet you still reject it. You still reject it. You don't keep it. The Jews claim to be, remember, these people, these Jews, Paul being one of them, right, said, oh, we keep the law perfectly. That's what they would tell you. We keep the law perfectly. That's why Jesus said, well, okay, um, if you even have lust in your heart after someone of the opposite sex, you've committed adultery. So he was trying to show them, you haven't kept the law. You have, you have no ability to keep the law. That's why I had to send to you my son. So now, hey, I want you to think about this, these last couple of verses, stiff-necked and uncircumcised. And this is what these great religious leaders... Now, look, look, watch the meltdown. Complete meltdown of these great religious leaders. We'll read this. 54 to 60. It says, Now when they heard this, the Sanhedrin, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. I love that phrase, gnashing of teeth. Uh, and being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. This is Stephen. And Jesus, is an entry, standing at the right hand of God. Not sitting, not seated, but standing like, come on. That's, what he, that's, what, that's the way I vision. And he said, Stephen said to them, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's blasphemy to the Jews. Right? But they, the Sanhedrin, cried out in a loud voice. They covered their ears and rushed at him in one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And they listened to these great words. Then falling to his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Wow. Wow. They got so mad when he accused them of rejecting the Messiah. They got so mad that they ran him out. And you know what they would do? This was, they ran him out of the city into a stoning pit, which is a, it's a hole, and then they would throw the rocks on you and kill you in the hole. And that's an ugly way to die. But look, how, but look how Stephen did this. Isn't it interesting? Martyrdom. Here's our first martyr. And who did he get martyred by? Who did he get killed by? The religious leaders. Right. Um, God made him a great saint in heaven. And you think, man, this guy could have been a great saint here on earth. He could have done lots of things. But God looked down and said, he did exactly what I needed him to do. That was his mission. I prepared him his entire life for it. He accepted the mission. He did it. And now I'm taking him home. Did he, did he say to forgive the people who stoned him? Yes. Like Christ said to forgive us yes. on the cross? Exactly. 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 He was mimicking Jesus. Isn't that cool? What are we supposed to do? Mimic Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. They hated it. It says they were cut to the quick. And here's the thing. And we always think, or at least I always think, you know, why can't why won't people accept the gospel message? Because the truth cuts when it's presented, and we either accept it or you fight against it. There's no middle ground. Jesus said, I'll spit you out. You're Luke, we said to the church, I forget which church in Revelation. He said, you're not hot or cold. So therefore, you're lukewarm and we'll spit you out. You can't sit in the middle. Truth either convicts, well, it convicts always, right? But you either accept it or you reject it. The truth brought conviction to the Sanhedrin and the conviction of conscious and stubborn resistance. And instead of softening their hearts, it hardened their hearts. And they, I mean, it says they're nagging. Mean, these are supposed to be sophisticated, educated leaders. And they're gnashing their teeth and covering their ears like children. That's what little kids do, right? Scream. That's what they're doing. And then they rushed at him before they could even get the Romans involved. Out the door. Of course, remember, they have their own, they, they have their own police force, so they can do what they want. 
Truth never leaves a, I read this great, this great quote, truth never leaves a person neutral. It will drive a person to yield or to balk. Truth never leaves a person neutral. It drives a person to yield or to balk. Truth drives a person to a decision. And look what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34 to 36. It says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. Isn't that weird? I know I've read that a million times, but I still always fall. I thought Jesus came to bring peace to the world. Right? He says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Does that ring true to anybody? The members of your own household That's prophecy too. that are rejected, right? The natural unsaved man hates the truth of Christ and refuses to bow to his lordship. We read it, we studied it in the Gospel of John. Darkness hates the light, is what it says. Hates. So, of course, if darkness hates the light, then they're not going to be neutral on Jesus, right? If men resist, bug, and even get angry when the truth is presented, what do we know? What do we know immediately? If somebody gets all torqued up when the truth is presented to them, what do we know? The Holy Spirit is bringing conviction. Otherwise, why would you be upset? You call me a name, doesn't matter. That's what it is. And he had this vision. It says, uh, and Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, If you have then been raised up with Christ, and I think this goes to what you were saying, Susan, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Well, when we read Stephen's, these last verses about Stephen, doesn't that set up perfectly for him? Look what he did. It says, if you've been raised up with Christ, which he was, he was a believer, keep seeking the things that are above. He did that, right? He looked, he says, being fully, he looks at them, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and what does he do? He tells the people that are killing him because of the stand for Christ, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. In other words, he's saying, Jesus that you killed is alive and he is standing with God. And he was, so what was he doing? He wasn't focused on the fact that they were throwing stones at him. He was focused on heaven. That's how it came out. Um, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. That's going through the motions is setting your, setting your mind on things of the earth. Our emotions, our traditions. Da, da, da. That's how churches over the years just fall. They get all this caught up in tradition of this and that. And then why do churches split? Because we want to use a guitar on stage. Ah! Blasphemy, blasphemy. Can't do that. I mean, churches have split over choir robes. I'm not kidding. It's true. Split over choir robes, over organs, instruments. Right? Going through the motions. They forgot about God. It was all about, oh, this is what I like. This is why, oh, we can't do hymns. We can't, we can't do praise and worship. We have to do hymns because God only recognizes hymns. Right? Isn't that true? Hey, God, I missed another one. Do that. Right? Stephen was always looking towards heaven. And because of that, God gave him a vision. You know, I really, this is, again, with my opinion. I really, so much so, especially this year, as we've studied on missions, is this view that Stephen looking towards heaven, God gave him a vision. If we want a vision from God, and so what, what kind of vision would you want from God? A direction? A goal? What's he want you to do? Well, then we need to do like Stephen and get looking towards heaven. That's where we seek things above. Right? And he goes through this terrible death. Right, They covered their ears. Why did they cover their ears? Because they didn't want to hear the truth. And it's interesting. God did not deliver Stephen from death, but through death. Through death, God delivered him into heaven. Sometimes, like we talked about with Peter and John, God delivered them from death. But what it shows is God's sovereignty. And, it, and when I look at Peter and John who got delivered from death, and I look at Stephen who got delivered through death. It reminds me when Peter said to Jesus, because uh, Jesus, Jesus told him he was going to be sifted, right? He's allowing Satan to sift him. And what did Peter say? Took the focus off of himself. What about John? 
And Jesus, paraphrased, said, what happens if John's none of your business? You do what God's called you to do, and John will do what God called him to do. And if God, you know, James got killed early. John lived to 100 years old or somewhere around there. So we don't know. Peter and John got delivered out of the jail. The Sanhedrin wanted to kill them, and they didn't. Stephen didn't have the same, didn't have the same thing. But what we know is God is God, and he does as he pleases in heaven and on earth, and everything that he does is right. So when we look at everything God does is right, I would have looked and said, you know, God, I think Stephen's a pretty bright guy, pretty bold for Christ. I'll leave him here. He says, I have a mission for Stephen. And it lasted about 60 days. And that's probably where we are time-wise from Pentecost. About 60 days. So he'd been indwelled with the Holy Spirit about 60 days. Again, I said last week, and remind you this week, that sure blows up prosperity gospel, doesn't it? Because wouldn't God want him to be healthy, wealthy, and wise? And have a long life and all the things that could make life pleasurable? It made life real pleasurable. Um, and this is interesting. We see our guy Saul, right, for the first time. He's standing there. And if you go to verse, if you go to chapter 8, verse 1, it says he was, he was all on board with everything they were doing. He was holding their coats. And he was all on board with it. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that we see um, Saul heard everything that Stephen had said. So Saul had heard Stephen's speech. And you know, we know, historically we know how bright Paul was, right? The Pharisee of Pharisees knew the Old Testament, knew the Ork, which really the oracles of God, knew them inside out, backwards, forwards. And then here's Stephen giving him this history. It's got to be resonating in Paul's mind somewhere, but he rejects it. He's outside. He's not throwing stones, but he's there. And it says he 100% agreed. In chapter 8, verse 1, he, he agreed with everything they were saying and everything they were doing. He had rejected God. He participated in the killing of a Christian. And yet God used him as one of the most powerful men of all time for the kingdom. Um, so I read somewhere where it said Stephen died so, so Saul of Tarsus could be brought forth. I don't know if that's really true. Um, all I know is it says that when the church is persecuted, the more the church is rejected, the more the church grows. Historically, from Acts, and by the way, remember the book of Acts is still being written today. It's Acts, uh, you know, Acts of the Church. So we're still part of the story. Whenever the church historically has been persecuted, it's always grown. Saint Aug or, uh, Augustine said, "The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church." Tertullian said this. He said, "The more you mow us down, the more we grow." Wow. And by the way, Christians are getting mowed down around the world today a lot. Um, Stephen, Stephen called Jesus Lord. So let me just conclude because we've got to finish up with this. Let me give you just a um, few things that we learned from the death of Stephen. First, Stephen is a witness to the reality of the unseen and the supremacy of the spiritual. He was spiritually motivated. He was walking by the Spirit. His life was not wasted. His life was not a tragedy. His life and death brought glory to God. That's what it did. Second, um, a man doesn't have to have a long ministry to have an effective ministry. Stephen didn't have a very long one, but boy, it was powerful, wasn't it? I mean, it's one of the most well-known stories in the Scriptures. Third, whether a Christian dies as a martyr or natural causes, his death can provide powerful testimony to the unbelieving world which has no hope. Fred, that made me think of uh, Eric's friend Rob, right? right? So when I thought about that, a Christian, whether a Christian dies as a martyr or of natural causes, his death can provide powerful testimony to an unbelieving world. That's why we always use services like that to present the gospel, because we know we're going to have people in there who haven't heard it. Still praying for us. For Stephen's name means crown in Greek, right? And it's interesting because there is a martyr's crown. There are different crowns, study crowns. There are different crowns that you get. And we get to take those crowns and we put them at the, the, at the feet of God. He will have a martyr's crown to do. <clears throat> Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Lastly, Stephen's life is a prototype of all Christian martyrs. They see what happens. The book of Acts, um, as we said, is never closed. It continues on to this day. Remember, there are crowns for martyrs and we see that with Stephen. So next week we'll jump into uh, chapter 8 and uh, hopefully you've gotten some hopefully you've gotten something out of this idea of the sin of forgetting God. We watched the Jews do it for thousands of years 
And uh, so let's make sure that we've got, we're got we walking and living by the power of the Holy Spirit, which will keep us from going through the motions. And we'll seek where God wants us to be. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And where maybe this week we'll go back and look at chapter 7 again and read through it and hear the powerful testimony and um, really understand that your chosen people spent a lot of time rejecting you and rejecting your messengers. And I think we take solace out of that as we look at the mission field that's all around us, Lord, that, um, that we would be bold for you in those, in, those, uh, in those fields, Lord, because the harvest is there and that's what you want. We don't want to reject Christ, Lord, but I fear we can reject him by not sharing him, Lord, because we're not, we're not standing on the solid ground that you called us to stand on. So, Lord, give us, give us opportunity this week to reflect on, on who the Jews were, how they were temple-focused, and, Lord, how we don't want to be church-focused, but instead we want to be indwelt with your Spirit, filled with your Spirit, to be bold for you in all that we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.